Okay, I think I'll start now. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us in our very first Allworth Lecture Zoom webinar. I'm really uh, delighted that you've decided to join us and spend your evening with us. Uh, my name is Tom Morgan. I am the director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at the College of St. Scholastica. I really shouldn't say here at the College of St. Scholastica because I'm speaking to you from my home uh, in Duluth, about six miles from St. Scholastica. Um, and you all found me, delighted, found us. Um, and so we're doing our lecture series this year virtually for reasons that I think you can all imagine. Uh, these lectures are sponsored by the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice at the College of St. Scholastica and funded in part by the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation, and the Mary C. Van Evra Foundation Endowed Fund in memory of William Van Evra, a former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received from the Edwin H. Eddy Foundation, the Royal D. Allworth Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth, the UMD Department of World Languages and Cultures, Reader Weekly of Duluth, and numerous other private sources. As always, we're delighted and grateful for your support that keeps these programs going. A couple of housekeeping issues or, that you, I want you to know um, that if you need captioning for this uh, program, it's available. It's right on the menu bar in front of you, I think, in front of my image right now where it says closed caption, you can click on that and you should be able to get captioning if you need it. Um, those of you who uh, aren't on our mailing list or our email list and want to be, we have an opportunity for you to do that to hit the chat bar anytime in the course of the evening. Give us your email or give us your street address or give us both if you want to receive emails about future programming and um, or if you want to receive postcards in the mail on a regular basis and we'll take care of that of course. Uh, after the program, after the remarks from our speaker, um, as we always do uh, in the Mitchell when we have our programs there, um, we'll have a question and answer period. Our speaker has graciously agreed to answer questions and sometimes that's the most interesting part of these evenings when the dialogue gets going. So if you wanna ask questions, you hit the, right next to the chat bar, it's the best place to go, where it says Q and A. And you can type in your questions and uh, my <clears throat> colleague, Brianne Tepler, who you'll meet in a little while, will help uh, field those Q and A issues with you, for us. Our speaker this evening, as you all know, is a National Public Radio award-winning correspondent who has enjoyed a rich association with public radio for nearly 40 years. In fact, <laughs> one of NPR's pioneer foreign correspondents posted first in Latin America and then in Central Europe where he covered his, the wars in the former Yugoslavia and the transitions to democracy in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. After returning from his overseas assignments, Mr. Jelton covered US diplomacy and military affairs. He's written or made significant contributions to five books and has contributed to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic Magazine and numerous other publications. His latest book, A Nation of Nations, is available at the bookstore at Fitker's here in Duluth, as well as at other outlets. One of his recent projects for NPR was reporting how the faith of Catholics in Pennsylvania informs their thinking in the current presidential campaign. Mr. Jelton's roots are here in the Midwest where he attended the University of Minnesota and worked on the Minnesota Daily, the campus publication. At the, during those years, he spent a good deal of time on our North Shore of Lake Superior, hiking and skiing and enjoying a family cabin near Hovland. He still enjoys the great outdoors and regular exercise. In fact, he recently completed a cross country bike ride from Portland, Oregon to Seabrook, New Hampshire. These days, he and his wife, ABC correspondent Martha Raditz, enjoy a rich family life that includes looking after granddaughters Magnolia 7 and Morgan 5. He joins us this evening from his home in Arlington, Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tom Jelton. 
Well, thank you very much, Tom. You know, I, I really wish I could be there because um, I was looking forward very much to this trip. Uh, as Tom said, I have some connections to the area and fond memories. The cabin that we used to visit was um, about 20 miles uh, on the other side of Grand Marais. I'm sure it's beautiful this time of year. And I was hoping to spend some time in the area when I came out. Um, so that's a disappointment. The other thing is, I have to tell you, I am really sick and tired of these Zoom presentations, as I'm sure many of you are. So I really appreciate those of you who are joining us. Um, you may have other things to do. And I realize also that many of you that are now watching uh, actually are not watching live or catching up to it uh, later. Um, uh, so, um, but I, you know, on the other hand, uh, I think that we are not, we have to admit that we're not yet ready for in-person presentations much as we wish we could be. Uh, I think we're gonna have to be patient. Uh, we will get back to that uh, maybe next fall. Maybe I'll have a chance to come out to the North Shore uh, next fall. So my topic tonight, as Tom suggested, is um, welcoming new immigrants. And you know, in, um, back in 1958, uh, then Senator John Kennedy came out with a book that he called A Nation of Immigrants. I have it here because I used it for my um, research for, for this book. And the fact is, I, I think that's one of the first times that we've had an American politician sort of identifying America literally as a nation of immigrants. Um, but it has long been a key to America's identity. We, we are, in fact, a nation of immigrants. It's our foundational identity. And it is true, we are a nation of immigrants, but with some caveats. And that's what I really wanna talk about tonight. So if we go back to the very beginning of American history, America was colonized about 400 years ago at Jamestown and Plymouth Plantation, even earlier if you count the Spanish colonists in Florida. The country was settled by people coming from other lands, people of various nationalities, various religious backgrounds, from various countries coming for various reasons. And from the beginning, that aspect of our history made America unique. The people in Europe, for example, came with the territory. In America, the territory came first and those coming from other lands became Americans by swearing their allegiance to this nation, by identifying with it and the ideology on which it was founded. Now, Keep in mind, the people who colonized America, what became the United States, came from countries that had been at war with each other. At the very time the United States was settled, Europe was being torn apart by the Thirty Years' War. Over the course of that war, as many as eight million people died. It began as a religious conflict, largely between Catholics and Protestants, but as it progressed, it was about who would control Europe. Also, another fact, many of the people who settled this country were fleeing religious persecution. In fact, arguably the founding principle of America, the most important principle from the beginning was this idea of religious freedom, that people should be able to live whatever religion they had and that the state, the government, should not dictate which religions were acceptable, which were not. Um, so from the beginning, this was to be a country where people could get a fresh start. In 1783, George Washington told a group of immigrants from Ireland that, quote, the bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respectable stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions. Over and over, this was the refrain of the founders. John Quincy Adams said Americans must look forward to their posterity rather than backwards to their ancestry. Or as the immigration historian Oscar Hamlin said, America was a country whose people were defined not by common descent, but by common destiny. So in this sense, America was unique in the world and, and it impressed people coming from Europe, like Alexei de Tocqueville, a French travel writer, a sociologist and historian who visited America in 1831. After traveling around, he was struck by the egalitarian quality of the country. He said it was a country, quote, where the inhabitants arrived but as yesterday upon the soil which they now occupy and brought neither customs nor traditions with them there. 
to de Tocqueville, it appeared that class differences or family background mattered little in America. In the old world, genealogy channeled people into one or another future, but in America, the abundance of opportunity produced a degree of social mobility unmatched anywhere else in the world. And de Tocqueville said, the position of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional. I actually think he was the first person to use that word to describe America as an exceptional nation. And it's one, of course, we've heard a lot more in recent years. And I think to, to an extent, all of this was true. The title of my book, A Nation of Nations, actually comes from Walt Whitman, who's sort of the quintessential poet laureate of the United States. In the preface to his book of poems, Leaves of Grass, he wrote that the Americans of all nations at any time upon the earth have probably the fullest poetical nature. The United States themselves, Whitman wrote, are essentially the greatest poem. Here is not merely a nation, but a teeming nation of nations. So this is the foundational idea of this country, which is why I used it as the title of my book. More than an idea, it was an ideal, a conception of what the country was meant to be or should be. So that's the sort of the founding myth. Now for the caveats. First of all, obviously, the whole idea that we are a nation of immigrants disqualifies the truly Native Americans. This was not an empty land where the colonists came from Europe. There were people here. They literally did not count. They were to be conquered or exterminated. So that's the first thing. Also, while we were indeed established as a nation of immigrants, it was white European immigrants. Remember George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were both, were both slaveholders. Black people, like Native Americans, did not count in this new country. The first immigration law, which was passed in 1790, offered citizenship only to free white persons. Now, in a sense, there was something normal about this in as much as the pattern of transcontinental migration at that time was from Northern Europe, Northern and Western Europe in particular, to North America. So, while there were national and religious differences to be overcome in this new land, as I said, they were differences among white Europeans. Very few people were immigrants coming voluntarily from the Middle East or from Africa or from Asia. So this ideal of a country where everyone could get a fresh start, regardless of background, and be judged on their own merits, in a sense, wasn't that hard to meet. But even so, in time, even that ideal was challenged because before long, those who had come first began to look down on newcomers. You actually had a nativist reaction. And when you had big groups of people coming together from a particular place, they often faced special hostility. Thus we saw the anti-Irish sentiment. And a few years later, as Chinese laborers began coming in large numbers to work in the mines out west or on the Transcontinental Railroad, and in agriculture, you had intense anti-Chinese sentiment. In fact, in 1876, the Democratic Party platform lamented how Chinese immigration was exposing the country to the incursions of a race that did not spring from the same great parent stock of the country. Six years later, the US Congress passed the famous Chinese Exclusion Act, closing America's doors to immigrants from China almost entirely. It was the first of many anti-immigrant laws passed in this country. And yet, and yet, that other notion of our national identity, the idealistic one, the idea that the United States could actually be the first universal, universal nation remained, at least, at least in theory, we were not to be a nation that is defined by ethnicity or religion. Now, you can argue that that principle didn't matter if we didn't live by it. We had the genocide of the Native American population. We enslaved a large segment of our population, treated them as property to be bought and sold. And then even after their emancipation, we denied them their rights, allowed them to be lynched. We didn't give women the right to vote. But I would still argue that principles mattered, that words mattered because for many, they represented an aspiration. Even if they 
those words didn't yet correspond with reality. This was, for example, the view of Frederick Douglass. As a former slave, you know, he gave a speech on the 4th of July, famously saying, it is not my holiday. But in that same speech, Douglass went on to say, drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered. So for him, those words mattered, even if they weren't being put into reality. Remember also how Abraham Lincoln, in his Gettysburg Address, noted that this nation was, in his words, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The proposition, that's the most important word in that phrase. It was not, he was not giving a statement of what was in practice. He went on to say the Civil War was testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. So we had the promise, the proposition, and then we get the test of that proposition. It's a test that's been going on in this country now for more than 200 years. And this is the great American immigration drama, this ongoing conflict between two rival notions of the American nation. Because during this whole period, there was continually a debate over which of these two conceptions of the country should prevail, the idealistic conception or the more restrictive one. I'm just gonna give you one example. This is from the late 19th century. Two upper-class lawyers from Massachusetts, both graduates of Harvard Law School, both blue bloods, both descended from families who came to America from England in the 1600s, 1600s. but on separate sides of this debate about America's identity and our attitude toward immigrants. One of them was a Republican serving in the US Senate by the name of George Frisbee Hoare. He's from Massachusetts. Senator Hoare was a devout Christian. He was outraged by the introduction of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and he delivered an extraordinary speech on the Senate floor in opposition to that act. He focused in his speech on the words in the Declaration of Independence that everyone is created with unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He said those last words, the right to pursue happiness, meant his words, the right of every human being to go everywhere on the surface of the earth that his welfare may require, that is beyond the rightful control of government. He said, it's a birthright derived immediately from him who made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Hoare argued that the framers of the Constitution intended that the country's laws should make no distinction between men except as required by personal conduct and character. He asked how Congress could deny to the Chinese what you may not deny to the Irishman. Are we to hold out two faces to the world, one to Europe and another to Asia, he asked, are we to admit that the doctrine of human rights we have proclaimed so constantly for the first century of our history is a mere empty phrase or lie? That was the speech that Senator George Frisbee Hoare gave on the floor of the Senate in 1882 in response to the consideration of the Chinese Exclusion Act. So you had his voice. But in the years that followed, opposition to immigration grew steadily. Now, during this time, the pattern of immigration was changing. No longer was it primarily a flow of people from Northern and Western Europe. More and more immigrants were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. They dressed differently. Many of them were poor. They were generally less educated. Jews were coming in larger numbers, fleeing persecution in Russia and Eastern Europe. And with this new pattern of immigration, anti-immigrant sentiment grew stronger. So then you get this second blue blood lawyer from Massachusetts, also a Harvard man. His name was Prescott Hall. And his view of immigrants was precisely the opposite of George Frisbee Hoare's. Rather than saying America should be welcoming of people from different backgrounds, Prescott Hall said America was and should always be a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation. That immigrants who did not fit that mold did not belong in America. 
He was a co-founder of something called the Immigration Restriction League. And in that capacity, he posed this question. Do we want this country to be peopled by British, German, and Scandinavian stock, historically free, energetic, progressive, or by Slav, Latin, and Asiatic races, historically downtrodden, atavistic, and stagnant? Just the opposite of an inclusive message. Well, meanwhile, immigrants continued to come to the country. By the turn of the 19th century, about a million immigrants were arriving here each year. And in the early years of the 20th century, about one out of seven Americans were foreign born. It was during this period that my own grandparents came, in their case from Norway, settling in Minnesota and North Dakota. In 1903, a plaque was installed at the Statue of Liberty in New York. The statue itself had been dedicated in 1886, not far from Ellis Island, where thousands of immigrants were being processed. The statue was built facing east toward Europe, and it was the first thing many immigrants from Europe saw as they arrived in New York Harbor by boat. This lady holding a lamp up to the sky and looking out to the sea. The inscription on that plaque, I'm sure you've heard the words, came from a poem called The New Colossus. It was written by a young Jewish woman named Emma Lazarus. She had been moved by the persecution of Jews in the pogroms in Russia and Eastern Europe, and she saw America as the land that would offer them refuge. You know the famous words of the poem, the words that she imagined Lady Liberty to be saying as she looked out across the seas. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Again, you hear this idealistic voice, the welcoming voice against the voice of exclusion and hostility. By 1905, more than a million immigrants were coming each year, a level that would not be reached again for 90 years. But hysteria about this immigrant wave by then was running wild. Congress around this time set up a commission to study the immigration pattern. It was under the leadership of a Republican senator from Vermont named William Gillingham. The commission's report in 1911 included, get this, a dictionary of races and peoples with generalizations about which countries produced good immigrants and which produced undesirable ones. Immigrants from the Slavic countries, that would be Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other countries in Eastern Europe were seen, according to this dictionary, as fanatic in their religion, careless in their business practices, and dishonest. Italians were seen as excitable, impulsive, and impractical. The Scandinavians, once again, were identified as the purest type. Meanwhile, racism in this country was at a fever pitch. The Ku Klux Klan was on the rampage. And in 1916, a lawyer and zoologist named Madison Grant wrote a best-selling book called The Passing of the Great Race, in which he categorized and ranked people on the basis of their national origin. Negroids, Mongoloids, and Caucasoids. And you can guess which one he ranked on top. And even within that Caucasoid class, he subdivided them into Nordics, Alpines, and Mediterraneans. The Nordics, you guessed it, were the elite group. Now, that was 100 years ago. I might point out, parenthetically, that our current president in 2018 is said to have complained at a White House meeting that America was taking too many immigrants from places like Haiti, El Salvador, and Africa. I, won't repeat, I, don't, I don't want to repeat the word he used to characterize those countries, the ones from which they came. And then he supposedly said, we should have more people from Norway. So apparently the Scandinavians, my people, still rank high in the view of some important people. But back to the early 20th century, back to the work of the Dillingham Commission and writers such as Madison Grant. They were hugely influential in, US, in the US Congress at the time. And in response to their arguments, Congress passed some new immigration laws, first in 1917 and then in 1924, that put into practice 
their ideas of white supremacy. What we got was the infamous national origin quotas. These quotas had two main effects. First, they sharply cut back the overall number of people who could receive immigrant visas each year back to about 165,000 a year. That was one fifth of the number of immigrants who had been coming in each year before World War I. The second thing is it severely restricted which immigrants could come to make sure they were as white as possible. Immigrants from Northern and Western Europe were given priority. About 140,000 of those 165,000 slots were reserved for them. All of Southern and Eastern Europe was allocated just 20,000 slots, even though that's where most of the immigrants were coming from at that time. And meanwhile, all the countries of Asia and Africa combined were given just 3,000 slots. And the effect of these national origin quotas, not surprisingly, was that immigration by the 1930s slowed to a trickle. And a huge backlog developed of people who wanted to come here, maybe they wanted to join their family, but were unable to get an immigrant visa. So those national origin quotas stayed in place for about 40 years. Not without opposition, one of those who argued that we should be open to all and loyal to our founding principles was a Democratic congressman from Brooklyn named Emanuel Seller. He arrived in Congress in 1923 and spent the next four decades working to get rid of those national origin quotas. For many years, it was a pretty lonely fight. Not until the 1950s did you have a significant group in Congress and the rest of the US government agreeing that it was time to get rid of the national origin quotas. The foreign policy elite of the country were concerned that those quotas were staining the country's reputation abroad. As you had the Soviet Union and other communist countries arguing that those quotas showed that America was actually a racist country. And that argument resonated in places like Italy where hundreds of thousands of people were waiting to come here and being denied visas. Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower both argued that the country needed to get rid of those quotas. When John Kennedy ran for president in 1960, he made the national origin quotas a campaign issue. In his case, he had a lot of Italians and East European Jews in his district, all of whom were disadvantaged under the quotas. So what finally changed the situation was the rise of the civil rights movement. By raising the question of whether African-Americans were entitled to equal rights, that movement also revived this old question of what kind of country were we to be? Were we to live up to our finding ideals or not? It was the same question that had been raised by Frederick Douglass, by Abraham Lincoln, or by George Frisbee Hoare. In other words, in, other, in fact, words matter. Principles matter even when they're not put into practice because they represent an aspiration. But the nativist forces of those who wanted to keep America as it had been were still strong as they had been for a more than 100 years. Changing the immigration laws was a hard sell politically. After becoming president, Kennedy did not mention the national origin quotas in either of his first State of the Union speeches. And right now, I'm going to go to some slides that will help me to, I think, explain this a little bit more. We begin with sorry. We begin with um, it was not until Lyndon Johnson took office uh, who was able to make changing the national origin quotas a priority. Right after the start of his presidency, in his 1964 State of the Union, just two months after Kennedy was assassinated, Johnson said this. Take a listen. Mr. Jelton, I'm unable to hear that. Is the volume on your computer low right now? Perhaps? Let me just check that.
sorry about this, folks. This is so, so some of the things that you experience when you're doing these things for the first time. And I'm still unable to hear that. I wonder if while you're also sharing screen, if you shared sound. Ah, right. That's right. Sorry, folks. Let me just. Okay, I need to be reminded where that share sound feature is because it's not showing up. Um, one moment. I'm going to pause the recording. He was assassinated. And listen, listen to what he said. A nation that was built by the immigrants of all lands can ask those who now seek admission, what can you do for our country? But we should not be asking, in what country were you born? So consider those words. Let me, let me fade it out a little bit at the, at the end. He says, a nation that was built by the immigrants of all lands can ask those who now seek admission, what can you do for our country? But we should not be asking, in what country were you born? So that was in 1964. Now, elections that year brought a big Democratic Party majority. We got the Civil Rights Act outlawing segregation in public accommodations. We got the Voting Rights Act. So the time was finally right to revisit immigration policy. And so we did get a new immigration law introduced that year that would finally abolish the national origin quotas. And the sponsor in the House was none other than Congressman Emanuel Seller of New York, who had been working against the national origin quotas since the day he arrived in 1924. And in the Senate, the sponsor of the new immigration bill was Philip Hart of Michigan. And if you look, interestingly enough, if you look at the debate in Congress that followed over whether the national origin quotas should be eliminated, you saw for the umpteenth time a replay of this old debate about what kind of country we were or should be. On the welcoming side, you had people like Senator Hart of Michigan. Listen to what he said about the reforms that he and Emanuel Seller were proposing. The incidents of religion, of place of birth, of the color God gave us, the way we spell our names, these are not the things on which America judges Americans or anybody else. The incidents of religion, place of birth, or the color God gave us, the way we spell our names, these are not the things on which America judges Americans or anybody else. That was 55 years ago and how that thought resonates today. But you did have the other side. You still had this other side with the argument that America was not after all, a country that should be open to everyone, that it was fundamentally a European country with an Anglo-Saxon heritage, and that this heritage needed to be preserved, that priority should be given to immigrants coming from that part of the world in order to maintain that Anglo-Saxon heritage. Several members of Congress said that people from outside Europe would not assimilate in the United States as readily as Europeans. Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina, for example, wondered whether people from Indonesia would become responsible U.S. citizens as readily as people from Ireland. Those were his examples. On another occasion, he said he opposed any plan to get rid of the quota system because that would mean people from Ethiopia would have the same right to come to America as people from England, people from France, or people from Germany. And he said, with all due respect to Ethiopia, I don't know of any contributions Ethiopia has made to the making of America. This obsession with the idea of African immigrants in particular was widespread. Senator Spessard Holland of Florida said, 
why are the first time are the emerging nations of Africa to be placed on the same basis as are our mother countries, Britain, Germany, the Scandinavian nation, and other uh, and France and other nations. But that argument reaped of prejudice. And by 1965, prejudice fortunately was becoming taboo. By an overwhelming majority, the US Congress in 1965 passed a new immigration act eliminating the national origin quotas finally, and in theory at least, opening the country's doors for the first time to immigrants of color. The 1965 Immigration Act belongs up there with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act or the Fair Housing Act. A pillar of civil rights legislation, they were all passed within a few months of each other. But it did take some work, it took some compromise. And actually here I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent because it's interesting in light of some of the current immigration debates. The chairman of the immigration subcommittee in the House was a conservative Democrat from Ohio named Michael Fian. Fian was allied with those conservatives who wanted to keep the national origin quotas, and he, resent, he, re, he relented only after President Johnson put the squeeze on him. This is a picture of President Johnson uh, on Air Force One with Fan. He flew out to Cleveland to help Fan during a tough primary fight. And in return for that help in his primary fight, he got Fian to let the Immigration Act finally go through. It was an example of the famous Johnson treatment. But Fian got something in return. Remember, Johnson's original idea that we quoted from the State of the Union message was that it was legitimate to ask potential immigrants, what can you do for our country? He wanted to give out visas essentially on a merit basis to those immigrants whose skill and education were considered especially advantageous to the country. Fian got that wording in the bill changed. He agreed that national origin quotas should be eliminated, but instead of giving priority to immigrants with the appropriate skills and education, he wanted to give priority to those immigrants who already had relatives in the country. It was a family unification scheme. And so what he was thinking is that you would, if you had a family unification scheme, you would get immigrants who were the same color and background as people already here, because there were very few Asians or Africans or Middle Easterners in the country. So they wouldn't be able to take advantage of this family unification program. In his view, it was a brilliant idea. Got rid of the national origin quotas, which were so objectionable, but the effect of the quotas would still be there with this new emphasis on family unification. In fact, the advocates of the old national origin quotas, when they saw this compromise, were satisfied. In their view, the system of giving visas first to people who already had relatives here would get, in their words, a naturally operating national origin system. And in fact, that was actually a quote by one of the groups that was opposed to this reform in the beginning. Now, for the supporters of this reform, the key objective was getting rid of the national origin quotas. And if it took a compromise to get it done, so be it. So President Johnson finally had his bill. He signed it, the 1965 Immigration Act, in a ceremony at the foot of the Statue of Liberty with a huge contingent of legislators on hand including Ted and Robert Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey, Michael Fian, Senator Philip Hart, and many others. An important principle was established by finally getting rid of the national origin quotas. But because of this change that Fian got put in, everyone thought it was going to have only a minor impact. Listen to what, here's what President Johnson said at the bill signing. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. It does not affect the lives of millions. But in fact, it was a revolutionary bill. And in, interestingly enough, ironically, precisely because of the family unification system. Here's why. By 1965, fewer and fewer Europeans had much desire to move to America. Europe had largely recovered from the war. Economies were improving. The drive to move to America by then was from what we used to call the third world, Asia, Latin America, Africa, also the Middle East. 
there was a lot of post-colonial political strife in those lands, insurgencies, wars for independence. Meanwhile, improved global communication and transportation networks made it more feasible to move than it had ever been. So that was where the immigration demand was. And there were ways to come here legally, even if you didn't have relatives here. For example, maybe you were a Korean woman married to an American soldier, that got you in. Maybe you had some special job skill that an American company desperately needed. That company could sponsor you to come here and work. Maybe you were a young African who got a scholarship to study here. Those were all legal ways to come here. And in each of those cases, once you got a foothold in the United States, under the Family Unification Program, you were entitled to bring your relatives here. I tell a story in my book of a Pakistani guy who was working for an American company in Pakistan. They got him over to the United States to work. Within a few words, a few years, that guy was responsible for bringing over about 100 of his relatives. And there were many other stories like that. It was the beginning of what folks came to call chain migration. In fact, you know, it has become uh, controversial. Our, our president uh, has said that he is opposed to chain migration and wants to change it. Ironically, chain migration is a phenomenon of a compromise in the 1965 Immigration Act that was originally meant to keep America as white as possible. Now, at the, here's the result. At the time the 1965 Act was passed, barely 5% of the U.S. population have been born outside the United States. And you see that uh, right about here. 1965 is only about 5%. By 2010, it was about 13%, highest in 100 years, and the share is still rising. Even more important, the profile of the immigrant population had changed dramatically. At the time of the 1965 Act, about seven of eight immigrants were coming from Europe. These are represented by the blue bars on this graph. Uh, not a big number, but the, um, that by the, at the, at the, uh, but meanwhile, about seven of eight immigrants were coming, <clears throat> sorry, let me say this again. The orange bar you see here are those immigrants who are coming from outside Europe. You see that in the beginning, all up until 1965, the min minority of immigrants coming were coming from outside Europe. And um, by the time the by 2010, uh, about nine of 10 immigrants were coming from outside Europe. This was the effect of getting rid of the national origin quotas. You saw this dramatic change in the profile of the immigrant population with a dramatic decline in the share of immigrants coming from Europe and a dramatic increase in the share of immigrants coming from outside Europe. What we saw was for the first time in our history, immigrants of color were being treated more or less the same as white immigrants. And the US, as a result, was fast becoming a truly diverse multicultural country. In my view, the 1965 Immigration Act was the most important legislation passed in the 20th century in terms of the impact it had on the country. Uh, as of today, more than half of American children under the age of five are non-white. And within about 25 years, a majority of the whole U.S. population will be non-white. Islam is now the fastest growing religion in the United States. We are finally becoming a truly universal nation where your bloodline, your race, your religion does not necessarily make you any more or less American. We have finally seen, after all these years, that principle put into practice. And a big part of my book is how America changed as a result, how our national identity has changed, what it means to be an American now that we are no longer shaped as much by our European heritage. Clearly, diversity and multiculturalism mean that not everybody thinks alike. It may mean we have different ideas of what America stands for based on the experience you bring to this country. And I explain that by stories of a few families who have come here in the last 50 years. I focus in my book on Fairfax County, Virginia, 
which is fortunately close to where I live, but also a place that has been dramatically changed by immigration in the last 40 or 50 years. In 1970, fewer than 3% of the people in Fairfax County had been born outside the US. By 2010, about one in three were born outside the US. One of the families that I profile is the Seong family who immigrated from South Korea where they were a dirt poor farming family. They lived on a farm uh, with Mr. Seong's parents, um, no electricity, no indoor plumbing. Through a relative, they heard about a program where you could get a work visa to come in a chicken processing plant because the company couldn't find American workers willing to do it. They moved here in 1976. They lived in a worker's dormitory and scraped every penny they could. And ultimately were able to send their daughter, Alex, to college. It was a classic immigrant story of hard work and humility. They always said to us, you know, this isn't really our country. You can't, you know, make waves, just study hard, just work hard, because this is not our country and we don't want, you know, we don't want to give our country or people a bad name. So that's one story of what America meant. Alex eventually made it to law school and there she met a, another young Korean immigrant named Mark. Now, Mark's story was different. His passion was politics. He studied political science in college and became enamored of the American political system, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the institutions of democracy. As a student, he volunteered for Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign. He was attracted by Jesse Jackson's notion of a rainbow coalition. He moved to Washington, got a job on Capitol Hill, and in 2009, he ran for a seat in the Virginia State Legislature and got elected. Mark was the first Asian immigrant ever elected to the state legislature in that state. For Mark Keem, what America stood for was democracy. It was its political system that impressed him most of all. And he stood as an example for other immigrants, including his own in-laws, Alex's father. When he met Mark and he saw what, what good he could do for our community and for America, he just really um, was proud and he really wanted to support him. Um, I'm sure he would have wanted him to go and become a congressman or just go as far as he could. So Alex gets a little choked up as she's telling this story because her father and mother both died shortly after Mark was elected to the legislature. They'd both been working miserable, menial jobs all their lives. And this is the next story, Issa Momis. She came with his family to the United States from Libya when he was 16, not speaking a word of English, but highly motivated. He studied every night with an Arabian Arabic English dictionary at his side. And by the time he graduated from high school, he was actually at the top of his class. He got accepted at Georgetown University and went on to study medicine and become a doctor. So there's that familiar immigrant theme. But what is special about Isam's story is something else. This family was Muslim. Back in Libya, of course, basically everybody is Muslim and neither Isam nor his siblings nor his parents thought much about it. It was only in America that Isam got interested in Islam. It was something that set him apart from his classmates. It was his own heritage. It's it was what made him unique. And he started going to his local mosque and eventually became quite devout, more so than his own parents. And what's remarkable about Isam's story is that he actually credits America for his discovery of Islam. All along the way, the educators that he met here encouraged him to explore his faith. His high school principal helped him to set up a prayer room where he and some other Muslim students could pray. At Georgetown University, a Catholic university, one of the chaplains helped Islam set up a Muslim Students Association. For Islam, what those experiences showed him was that America was a country where there is genuine religious freedom. He says he doesn't know of any other country, none in Europe, not even his own Libya, where he would have gotten as much support to delve into Islam as he found in America. 
the main reason why I love America more than anything else, and I consider it to be home by all means for me and for my children, is not just because I've lived here for as long as I have or just because I enjoy the blessings of being here. It's more because it nurtures what I believe defines me as an individual, which is my Islam. It defines me as an individual like Islam. Finally, we have the Alarcon family. Victor Alarcon moved to the United States from Bolivia following his sister-in-law. As, um, at the time, Bolivia was going through an economic crisis. Victor had a job and he could support his family there, but he thought he could do better. He came alone to this country at the invitation of his sister-in-law and started at the very bottom working as a dishwasher. His aspiration was to have his own business. His story is another aspect of the immigration experience. It's risky to move to another country. You are starting over with very few, if any, contacts. You don't know your way around. You don't have a language. You may not have a job offer. Unless you're fleeing war or tyranny, it's a deliberate choice to immigrate. And the people who make that choice are a special group. They are the risk takers. They are the ones who see the potential of a long-term reward as being worth the short-term risk. Victor's brother, on the other hand, chose not to leave Bolivia. That's the difference between the two of them. Here in America, Victor went about doing everything he could to get ahead. He learned about cars. At one point, he had his own car repair shop. He studied computers, worked for an IT company. All the time, he was self-taught. He had no help. Where did he learn all these skills? From his local public library. For me, the library was my second house. Everything that I need to learn about anything is go to the library. I have learned to fix any cards at all. I can do anything in the house. Electrical, AC, AC plumbing, water heated, I mean the whole thing. How I did it? I learned it in the books. I learned it in the books. Finally, one more story. This is Marta Quintanilla. She came from El Salvador. She lived there in a village in the countryside at a time when El Salvador was at war. She and her parents were uneducated. There was a little school in the area, but it was a 30 minute walk each way to school and Marta was needed at home to help her mother. But she too had that aspiration to improve her life. When she was 10 years old, she left home to go work in a, new by, in a nearby city to help a woman cleaning houses. Came back each weekend to share her earnings with her family. Now at the time between war and gangs, there was a lot of violence in El Salvador. People in her village were streaming out to the US now, with the support of her parents, she found someone willing to smuggle her to the U.S. border. It took a couple of attempts, but eventually she made it here. She got asylum in the U.S. She ultimately married an American soldier that she met while working on a military base. In 2014, she became a U.S. citizen. Her English is not all that good, so I don't have tape of her talking uh, about um, what America means to her. I'll just read what she told me. She said, I come home from work. I park my car in the parking lot. I come into my apartment and lock the door. I see my children sleeping. That's what America has given me. I can sleep peacefully here and not worry somebody is going to come in the night. You just have to follow the rules. So what we have between these various stories is a sense of what diversity means. Every one of these people has a different idea of what being America means to them, what America stands for. Democracy, religious freedom, opportunity, security, different ideas, but every one of these immigrant families have no trouble saying that America means something special to them. You ask them what America stands for and they can answer just like that in a way that derives directly from their own experience. What they all agree on is that America is exceptional for one reason or another. Their sense of what the country stands for binds them to this country. They do not take those ideas for granted because they did not have them in the countries from which they came. What this means is that they have a foundation. It's a special immigrant foundation for patriotism. It's a special patriotism that many immigrants feel 
And I think it actually distinguishes them from people who already lived there. As I said before, they were all risk takers. None of them spoke English when they arrived. They barely knew anyone here. The immigrant experience, as I said before, when it's voluntary, uh, is a filtering process. So it's not surprising that they are the entrepreneurs in this country. You know that one recent study found that nearly 28% of the country's entrepreneurs are immigrants, even though immigrants represent only 13% of the population. That means immigrants are twice as likely to become entrepreneurs as the native population. And that to me is the good news. My conclusion in writing this book was that America has demonstrated its resilience. The passage of the 1965 Act set up that test for the country that we have been postponing for so long. By opening its doors, America took the step it had promised to take from the beginning, but had never dared to take. It was an experiment to see if the country could open its doors and still hold on to a national identity. I concluded that it had worked, that the experience, the experiment was successful. I was at the nationalization ceremony when Marta became a US citizen. Uh, US citizen. There were about 500 naturalizations that day. And the people who, were, who became citizens that day came from 82 countries. About half of those countries had a non-Christian heritage. Three of the top four countries on the day that Martha became a citizen were India, Pakistan, and Ethiopia. Prior to 1965, those three countries had only a few hundred slots each. The fourth country, El Salvador, Martha's country. Now, this is not a picture of Martha's naturalization, but this is what naturalization ceremonies look like these days, or what they look like what they looked like before America began to close its doors once again. Because there is a coda to this story. Uh, writing it today, I would be less positive than I was then. I had sort of assumed that the debate we had in the 1960s, when I wrote this book, I had assumed that it was over, that um, we had finally decided that we were to be a, a diverse country. Um, but it has since become clear that once again, we are having that same old debate, the same debate we've had off and on for the past 150 years. Now, I'm not going to make this political. I don't want to pile on President Trump. I know he's in Duluth this evening. That's a special reason I don't want to. Uh, he certainly has got enough to deal with right now. But I think that what President Trump has demonstrated is that there are still many people in this country who are not comfortable with how the country has changed over these last 50, 50 years. When he ran for president in 2016, he made, as many of you recall, immigration a big issue. And although he did not say it explicitly, implicitly, he seemed to be suggesting that we should reconsider that 1965 Immigration Act. He very subtly raised some of the questions of whether it was the right move to get rid of those national origin quotas. He gave a speech in Phoenix in August 2016. This was his big immigration speech when he was running for president. And I pulled a couple of cuts from it to illustrate the message, the main message he had in that speech. He said he wanted to establish a new immigration commission to revisit our country's immigration policies and he listed some of the goals that he thought that commission should take on. Here's the first one. To keep immigration levels measured by population share within historical norms. Sounds innocuous, but what's interesting here is that is exactly how the national origin quotas came about. There was a formula based on historical norms to see that population shares would not go above a certain point. The Overall quotas for how many immigrants would come here were set as a percentage of those groups share in 1890. Now, he's not talking here about different quotas for different ethnicities. He's just talking about the overall levels. But then he listed a second goal for this commission. To select immigrants based on their likelihood of success in U.S. society. 
Now, this actually is closer to the idea of picking immigrants based on their national origin. Remember that one of the big arguments for keeping those national origin quotas was that Europeans were better able to assimilate than non-Europeans. President Trump was not saying that directly, but it was, in a sense, a, a, mis a message, I think, to those people who still felt that we should select immigrants on the basis of how well they fit in with this country. And people from strange foreign lands with a different religious background may not fit in, in their view, in some people's view, as easily. Now, I'm not so much interested in what Trump said during that came, campaign, is in how Americans reacted to what he said. He won that immigration, he won that election, and the immigration, as I said, was his big issue. He showed that fear of immigrants still runs deep in this country, and he has tapped into that fear. And, you know, I think that this is something that we have now seen in the last few years. Um, you know, I, I think back to what those senators like Sam Irvin said in 1965, when he objected to immigration reform on the basis that it would give the people of Ethiopia the same right to come to the United States as people from Western Europe. Uh, we saw President Trump, for example, recently in Minnesota, talking about the Somali immigrants in Minnesota and whether they fit into the country. Um, you know, way back in 1952, there was a bipartisan presidential commission reporting on whether it was time to change the national origin quota system. And that commission had this to say, we cannot continue to bask in the glory of an ancient and honorable tradition of providing haven to the oppressed and belie that tradition by ignoble and ungenerous immigration laws. We cannot develop an effective foreign policy if our immigration laws negate our role of world leadership. We cannot defend civil rights in principle and deny them in our immigration laws and in practice. That was in 1952, 68 years ago. Um, so my final point here, the debate over what kind of country America should be, how welcoming we should be of new populations goes back to the very early days of our Republic. I think we can conclude that this is one of the defining debates that it seems we will have over and over again. I applaud you, I applaud you at St. Scholastica for keeping this issue in the forefront, for promoting this conversation, and I wish you good success as you move through this year. And I apologize for that little snafu. Um, I wish I had a producer here to run my computer for me, but you know, we do what we can. We recovered quickly. It was just fine. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. Um, okay, you... now I'm on, aren't I? You are, and can I... you also um, start your video? Oh, I can do that. Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you, you. That's what we have you here for, to help us old men, you know, operate this equipment. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jelton, for, I think, a very fine talk. We do have time for questions uh, on the screen, at least on my screen, is my colleague, Brianne Tepler, and she is, uh, works all the magic behind the scenes, and she will be receiving your questions or sort of filtering them through, so, and then maybe putting them directly to Mr. Jelton. While we wait for a question or two to show up, and I hope they do, I don't want this to be just a dialogue between the two Toms. I hope the rest of the audience can take part. But while we're waiting for some questions, I have read your book. In fact, I've read it twice now because I'm teaching it this semester to a, a group of fine students. Um, there's an element in your book that you didn't include in your talk, and I would like you to say a few words about that. It's not, as you even have written in the book, it's not all sweetness and light with this immigration. There are some really tough, or have been, some really tough growing pains, have there not? In particular, I'm talking about minority on minority violence and tension. Say a few words about that and why that exists, do you think? But you're right, Tom. I do conclude in the end that um, I think that America has demonstrated its resilience, um, its capacity for um, handling this incredible influx of 
um, immigrants of color. As I say, the profile of the American population has changed so dramatically in the last 50 years. That is really not a very long time. And if I take, for example, Fairfax County, to go from 3% foreign-born population in 1970 to 33% in 2010, just 40 years later, that is a dramatic change. And I should also point out that Fairfax County during this time was going through two other very traumatic changes. One was desegregation, integration. Fairfax County had been largely a segregated county um, into the 1960s. It was also a largely rural county. And over the last 40 years, uh, Fairfax County has been, become completely integrated and it has become urbanized. Uh, it is now essentially a part of the Washington DC metropolitan area. So you have three phenomena here, immigration, desegregation, and urbanization, all of which can be very traumatic experiences for uh, a community to go through. And you're right, as I say in my book, I explain how traumatic that was. I do conclude in the end, it, it was handled successfully, but there were a, a lot of issues that had to be encountered along the way. I talked, for example, as I say, Fairfax County was segregated. There were some African-American communities in, in Fairfax County that only got the kind of schools they deserved and community institutions they deserved and the infrastructure, the streets, the uh, sewage system. Uh, they only got those sort of benefits for their community through hard work and organizing on their own. It took struggles on their part to get them. And then all of a sudden you've got immigrants flooding in. And because a lot of the African-American population lived in, in relatively uh, low income neighborhoods, those were the very neighborhoods that immigrants tended to move in as well. So you had uh, immigrants coming in and essentially able to take advantage of the benefits that the African-Americans had one for themselves, and now suddenly we're sharing with the immigrant population. There's a visit a community center that uh, the African American community there had worked for years to uh, establish, and all of a sudden it was, you know, in the view of some people, kind of overrun by immigrants who did not necessarily recognize how much work and sacrifice the African American population had gone through in order to. Uh, get that center built. There's also, inevitably, there is some economic competition. Uh, you know, um, if you look at the net effect of immigration on the labor market, it's in the most, for the most part, it is positive. Immigrants tend to create more jobs than they take away. However, if you take a more granular look, if you look at the lower end of the labor market, the end of the, the part of the labor market that where people of relatively low skill and low wages are employed. At that section, that sector of the labor market, it's clear that immigration has had some negative effects on the native population. So yeah, there are, there are those issues. And I think that it is important to be honest about that. You know, um, and it's clear that, um, it's clear particularly in the last uh, 20 years that the incorporation of uh, a new religion, Islam, into what is fundamentally a Christian country has, has not always been an easy process. There's been a lot of uh, hostility uh, directed against Muslim immigrants. There is, I know, even in Minnesota. So yeah, I don't mean to downplay that. I will, however, uh, say that in comparison to other countries that have experienced actually less of an immigration influx than we have, uh, we have done very well. We have done better than European countries, for example, who have dealt with smaller immigrant influxes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Brianne, it looks like there's a lot oh, of questions yeah. here. So now you can uh, put one to Mr. Jelton, please. Absolutely. Yes, we have about 14 questions in the queue, Mr. Jelton. So <laughs> first one, is, how might an equitable immigration policy be structured? Well, you know, I... Um, that's kind of a, equitable is a loaded term because you're asking me to sort of recommend a policy which journalists uh, don't like to do. I would say, for example, that a, how can I put this? I think a strong argument can be made for a merit-based immigrant immigration system. Uh, the kind that um, President Johnson originally proposed in that State of the Union speech that I quoted in 1964. This is incidentally the, the same kind of system that Canada has. 
And I think that Canada is generally seen as a pretty welcoming and inclusive country. So, um, and I think you can also argue that giving immigrant visas to people who are some distant relative here, I think you can raise the question of whether that's the most equitable way. I mean, you know, you had, you had um, in some cases, you had people coming here as children or as teenagers whose brothers back in their native country stayed behind. 30 or 40 years later, they may have lost touch with their siblings, but under the family unification system, those adult siblings of those immigrants could come here ahead of other people who might have had a stronger argument. So I, I do think that a, the country does need a debate about the relative merits of a skills-based system versus a family unification system. Brian, keep keep um, them coming. How can, how can we keep? No, I'm sorry. How can we, the public, help towards becoming the quote teeming nation of nations end quote again? You know what I think is most interesting, uh, and I've looked at this, is that those communities that have the highest exposure to immigrants tend to be the most tolerant of them. Those communities that have the least exposure to immigrants, who hear about immigrants on the news or social media, they tend to be the ones that are most hostile. We have seen, you know, this also goes for the LGBTQ population. The more exposure you have to people who are different from yourself, the more they become real people to you and not kind of abstract or sort of hostile symbolically, um, the more understanding and inclusive you come. It's, it's, you know, it's been shown empirically by data, by research that the more exposure you have, the more welcoming you can be. So for that reason, again, I sort of am more optimistic in the long run because the truth is that immigrants of color are gonna to continue to come to this country. Muslims are gonna to continue to come to this country. And I think in years, in time, we will inevitably become more tolerant. Wonderful, thank you. Next question, do you think immigration is going to be threatened in the US again? Well, I don't, well, I, you know, I think that economically, we now realize that we depend on immigration. Our population is getting older. There are many um, job areas, skill areas that where we cannot accommodate the labor needs with our native population. We are going to continue to depend on immigrants coming here to fill at least some jobs. So I think that the business sector in this country, in this country the, you know, um, uh, people who have our economic interests most at, at, uh, at heart are going to continue to want to keep immigrants coming to this country. Wonderful. Next question. What is the basis for a sound immigration policy for the U.S. into the future, if not family unification and racial quotas? And you did already mention merit-based. Is that the basis or what else would you um, mention? Well, um, <clears throat> I think that those are sort of the two main um, alternatives. The third alternative is far more controversial, which is simply that the United States should kind of open its doors um, and essentially let kind of the natural flow take place. People don't necessarily leave their home countries unless they have a good reason to. I, I, don't, I think you, can, you can't assume that if we were to completely open our borders, that everybody on, our, on other countries would come here because they have many reasons to stay where they are. There are people that are really determined to come here, very eager to come here. So sort of a third possibility would be to be, you know, much more open, uh, just to take in more, more immigrants, people who come here without papers, you know, rather than deporting them, give them a path to citizenship. You know, if they've gone through all the trouble of coming here, uh, you know, and it is very dangerous to come here sort of without papers, you know, you could say to them, all right, you came here, you took the risk to come here, you've demonstrated a kind of a, a interest in becoming American, all right, you can stay. Next question, should the U.S. have assimilation standards in language, dress, etc.? What about food? <laughs> Well, I think a lot of us, uh, including those of us who have lived, whose roots go back hundreds of years, would be um, not happy to have to all eat the same food. I think, you know, our cuisine, our musical heritage traditions, 
have all been enriched by, by immigrants, so certainly not food. Language, um, I think it's probably, um, I think it is important that people be able to communicate with each other, communicate with government officials. I think it's been, it's been, it's been good that government services are often provided in different languages. You know, in Fairfax County, uh, students in Fairfax County speak uh, uh, more than 80 foreign languages. And Fairfax County schools have employed uh, translators and interpreters to help those students. That you know, that one of the high schools that I looked at, the biggest department in the high school with the most teachers was the English as a Second Language department. Um, so it does make sense to sort of bend over backwards, I think, to help people whose languages are different. But what I have seen is that people want to learn English. And uh, you know, you don't need to sort of establish an English only policy uh, in government services or in schools. People, once they come here, they want to learn English. And we have seen through data that even immigrants who don't speak English when they come here, their children tend to become fluent. So it only takes like one generation for an immigrant family to become bilingual. So um, I don't think you have to enforce this. I don't think you have to insist on it. I think it will just happen on its own. Wonderful. Next question. Do you think there is a singular set of beliefs, values, and or traditions that define a specific American culture? And if there is, do you think it's necessary for immigrants to assimilate into this culture in order to succeed here? It depends on what you mean by culture. I think that there is a political culture that in fact you do need to sort of come to um, appreciate and accept. Um, not, a, you know, not a culture that has to do with religion or dress or food or, you know, or even social relations. But I do think that America has a particular political ideology. Uh, the principles are there in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. I think that anybody who wants to settle here needs to understand what the Constitution says and they should you know, agree to abide by that Constitution, accept that Constitution, you know, and that Constitution defines a kind of political culture. And, um, you know, there is an American ideology. It's a political ideology, uh, but there is an American ideology. In fact, uh, quite a bit has been written about this. What are sort of the essential elements of that ideology? I think it's important to define it narrowly, again, in political terms, not in social or broader cultural terms. But yeah, there is a, you know, there is a kind of an ethos that I think all Americans need to be willing to appreciate and accept. Next question, how frequently have anti-immigrant advocates argued that the American economy cannot absorb new immigrants or that American jobs must be protected against immigrants? You know, that is a, uh, of course, that argument has been, been made um, a lot. And it may be, you know, we're right now closing in on 14% of our population being foreign born. It may be that there is a saturation point. It may be that there is a point at which um, additional immigrants or a larger share of the immigrant population may begin to crowd out uh, native workers. Uh, I think that labor economists don't think we are at that point yet, except in, as I say, certain parts of the labor market. Um, it's interesting, um, we talked, Tom asked me before about the um, uh, tensions that existed between the native minority communities, African American community and immigrant communities. Um, some of the labor unions in this country, particularly in the early part of the 20th century, were actually very anti-immigrant for this reason. And you know, there was a lot of opposition to immigration from the African-American communities for these very reasons. I think labor leaders were very wary of the immigrant population. Um, some African-American leaders, um, you know, Barbara Jordan, who was a, a Congresswoman from Texas who later led a national commission studying immigration. Um, she thought that immigration should be restricted. So that has been there in the past. What's happened, I think, politically in recent years is that labor leaders have come to see the immigrant population as a population that they want to represent. And actually, labor unions in this country um, have within their ranks a larger and larger share of immigrants. 
So labor union, labor leaders now are very pro-immigrant because they see that immigrant population as part of their constituency. And also politically, I think African-American leaders also see um, Hispanic communities and um, other immigrant communities as natural allies, you know, to the extent they see white supremacy as a, a problem in this country, they're gonna be naturally allied with other non-white communities in this country. So some of those tensions that you referred to actually have dissipated. Next question, how can we address irrational fears of immigrant populations? Uh, I, I alluded to this before. I think that um, precisely because they are irrational, they don't stand up under close examination. And the way that they don't stand up is when people began to get to know immigrants themselves, when they get to know Muslims, when they get to know, you know, people, um, you know, hardworking young men and women from Central America who, you know, are phenomenally um, productive and efficient. Um, and, you know, many immigrants are more religious than the current native population, native born population. So I think that um, irrational fears, you know, are challenged by reason and by experience. And the more exposure that people have, the more those irrational fears are undermined. Next question. Do you think that immigration is going to continue to keep benefiting the U.S. or starting to not benefit it and why? And you already mentioned a little bit about saturation. Is there anything you'd add to your thoughts there? I think we have to kind of, um, we just have to see. Um, I don't think we're at that point yet. Uh, I think that um, you know, America is a really big country. We have a great economy. Uh, we, have an, uh, we have the capacity to absorb uh, a large population. I also think that rates of poverty in the world at large are going down. And um, we saw, we have seen, for example, in terms of the immigrant flow from Mexico, that it has really dramatically diminished. And one of the reasons is that the Mexican economy has really improved. You know, there are fewer immigrants coming from Latin America right now than from Asia. Um, and the immigrants from Asia are tending to come for more higher skilled jobs. So, you know, it's not just what we do in this country. It's not just the policies that we enact in this country. It's the conditions, the political and economic conditions in the sending countries that, is that are just as important to the extent that people see less reason, less have less motivation to immigrate, they're not gonna immigrate. They're not gonna come here. So, you know, it's, it's not just up to us. We see already changes in the rest of the world that if continuing could very well sort of reduce the demand to leave those countries and to come here. Great, I'm just looking through and it looks like a couple of these questions have already been answered. So I'm gonna skip through. That's, that's fine. Yeah, if the immigration quotas were to arise again like they did in the 1900s, do you think they would be as harsh as they were or would they lean more toward welcoming immigrants from countries outside of Europe? If you were to revise the immigration quotas, should they arise again, what changes would you make? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, we actually have a, we actually have a system of quotas now that are, in a sense, national origin quotas. And it sounds like I'm contradicting my entire speech, but it's not. Countries which have smaller populations aren't entitled to as many immigrant slots as countries with larger populations. So a country like India, if you were to have sort of reinstated origin quotas, a country like India would deserve to have a much larger quota than a country like uh, Nicaragua, simply because there are more people in India. Um, and if you really want to be equitable, you can't say, okay, we're going to take 20,000 people from every country in the world. That's going to be an equitable system. Everybody gets, you know, 20,000 slots. Well, that's not equitable because, you know, because there are so many more people wanting to immigrate in some countries than in others. So, <clears throat> I actually think that already we have a kind of a modified form of this kind of quota system, but th that would be an example of how you can sort of redesign it on an equitable basis to sort of set aside slots 
from countries based on how large those countries are, how many, um, or maybe how many applications you get from those countries, you know? So there are some countries that, you know, I talk about my immigrants coming from Norway. Well, I can tell you, not that many people living in Norway are like determined to come here the way my grandparents were. So you wouldn't have to have as many quotas reserved for people from Norway simply because there's not that much demand. So I suppose theoretically you could sort of devise a quota system that reflects the population of those countries, but also the demand for immigration from those countries. Brianne, okay. how many more questions do you have? Oh, we have seven in the queue. So Mr. Oh, Moore, did you goodness. want to give us a, a time limit? For well, that? how about, uh, you know, I, we could, this can go on all night, but I, but you know, we go to bed early in Minnesota and it's even an hour later in Arlington. So I promised we wouldn't go on forever. I've but already got about, the dishes done. Yeah, okay. <laughs> how about three more questions, right? Pick three good ones, all right? Can you handle three more? Yes. Mr. Sorry. Jelton, yeah, okay. Are you good, Mr. Jelton? Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. So here's one. We talked about some of these issues. What are some ways that this, this information can be broadcasted so that larger groups within the U.S. understand what's really going on with immigration? Well, you know, um, I'm a journalist. We have, believe it or not, at NPR, I cover religion. I don't cover immigration. We have two or three reporters that are, that are dedicated full time to um, immigration issues. I, I really think it's very important for news organizations, and I think NPR has done a terrific job on, um, on that beat. I think it's very important that news organizations have um, people on staff who are specialized in this area. Um, I mean, as a journalist, I think that the news media um, have a very special mission to inform our population about the most pressing issues that we face as a country. Um, I think that the faith community has an important role to play. Um, you know, this is something that I am um, obviously focused on because of my current beat covering religion. I think faith leaders, because if you look at, you know, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam, whether it's Judaism, whether it's the Buddhism or Hinduism, all of the great religions have within their precepts, you know, the idea of caring for your neighbor. So I think to the extent that faith leaders take it upon themselves to, to share this message, that would be important as well. Wonderful. Next question. What impact has higher education played on immigration historically and what role should it play now and in the future? Higher education. <clears throat> well, um, boy, you, that actually is a really controversial issue right now. Um, <clears throat> I know right here in uh, well, in Fairfax County, uh, I don't, I live in Arlington, but in Fairfax County, there's a big debate about um, STEM schools and uh, whether, you know, what it's, there are a lot of, some people say there's an over-representation of Asian students in some of these STEM schools, and that for that reason, more efforts need to be made to diversify the student populations. Um, I think that the same holds true in higher education, that you know, we have a legacy in this country of affirmative action. Um, uh, I think that you know, higher education institutions are constantly looking at the profile of their populations and wanting to make sure that, they, that their student populations reflect, uh, to a large extent, the population of the country. And I think that, you know, that <clears throat> those policies those admission policies have to be continually evaluated. And there are some tough decisions, uh, some tough challenges that, that they face. You know, do they sort of, do they, um, do they modify admission requirements in order to make sure that their population is representative or do they, um, you know, simply allow whoever is the most talented and skilled, you know, to get those slots. I think, I, I do think this is going to be a, this is going forward, this is gonna be a tough, a tough issue for higher education institutions to deal with. All right. One more question, huh? One more, the final one. I'm gonna take a couple <laughs> of these and, and, and put them into sure. one question. And it's really around the um, security risk that there is for immigrants who might be entering the country um, fleeing justice or, or a criminal situation. So I'm combining a couple different questions right. there. 
<clears throat> well, uh, I actually um, feel pretty strongly about this because I spent a lot of time in Central America, and I, Central America, for example, and I know what the conditions are, are like there. And if anything, they've become worse since I was there. I was there during wartime, so it wasn't exactly, you know, peaceful at that time. I think in many ways, because of gang violence in Central America, it's gotten more insecure. And I know that a lot of the people who are coming from Central America now, perhaps unlike past immigrant waves, are not coming for economic reasons. They're coming because they feel their lives are endangered back home, because of threats against their families, because of gang violence, gang warfare, because of crime. And um, if we don't take those motivations into consideration, and if we simply send those people back to the villages from which they have come, they are returning to some pretty dangerous situations. And I think that, I know that many of them are absolutely terrified about that prospect. And I just think that's a reality that we have to consider. Thank you very much, Mr. Tom Jelton and Brianne. Thank you for making us both look good and keeping the trains running on time. Uh, and thank well, you. I didn't look so good. But, you know. <laughs> oh, you look great. And thank you, uh, all the people that are still here. There's still quite a few of you uh, for taking part in this. Um, I just will plug your book again, Mr. Tom Jelton. It's available here in Duluth at the, the bookstore at Fitgers and any other place too. And uh, it's full of, I know, it's full of that kind of information. Uh, I appreciate very much your joining us. I hope, Mr. Jelton, that you can come to Minnesota sometime. And if you do, you bring your bicycle. I've oh, discovered sure. in talking with him that he and I have that in common. <laughs> He's a better bicyclist than I am, but I think maybe I can keep up with you. I'm sure uh, you can. Again, thank you all very much for coming. I just will plug, uh, the next program, we're going to take a little break because there's a big issue going on in this country that we don't want to get in the middle of. Uh, it involves a couple of people who want to be president. And uh, But back in, in the middle of November, we're going to have another uh, talk in this series. And it's a man by the name of Siketu Mehta. He is, uh, he is an immigrant, and he's an immigrant from Calcutta. Uh, and he's very successful. Sounds like he could be in uh, Tom Jelton's book. He's done very well for himself. But I think hearing from uh, that perspective, I think will be useful for all of us. That's all on the website. And if you, again, if you want to be on our mailing list or email list, let us know. And we'll certainly put you there. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for Tom Jelton. Thank you, Brian, and for everybody who made this possible. Good night. Thank you all. Yeah, good night. <laughs>